Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Tales of the LGBTQ+. My name is Douglas Parsons. I want to start by thanking Jody Cuff, Jake Sheffer, Pam Hoffman, and Karen Hoffman for their monthly contribution with virtual coffees on the Buy Me A Coffee website, which helps support Tales of the LGBTQ podcast. They're supporting us monthly, and by doing so, they're able to unlock different features. Features such as being identified as a producer of the show, uh, a thank you, like we're hearing right now, to being a co-host for a future uh, presentation. There's lots of different things. Or one can do a one-time virtual coffee as well, and we greatly appreciate it. Again, everything that is raised through the Buy Me A Coffee site goes towards the editing, mixing, and sound of these individual episodes. So thank you once again. Now, with that aside, I sometimes wonder why I decided that doing a visual podcast was a good component as well, especially here in this pandemic time. I don't get out often. I notice the bags under my eyes my translucent skin, and cowlicks for days. <sighs> 2020 and 2021 have been rough on the esteem of myself. Now, I only mention this, and I do mention this jokingly as well, because really, I don't care. But I mention this because today's guest is Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair is one of Alberta's, one of Canada's preeminent drag queens. She has been within this field for over 20 years, and she keeps becoming stronger and stronger. Dare I say, a legend, or legs and dairy, for some in the know. She's been involved in many different causes. She is a charity queen. She goes out and she supports. If she says she's going to do something, she does it. She's been involved with the Imperial Sovereign Court of the Wild Rose for many years. In fact, she, is, she has been a reigning empress. A reigning empress that we're going to talk about in today's interview. Now, why did I mention my cowlicks, my eye bags, my translucent skin? <laughs> because Vanity Fair, she looks divine. She looks incredible. And when you put the two of us on the screen together, yeah, focus your attention on her, please and thank you. Um, yeah, just absolutely stunning. For those of you who are listening through the audio feed, just imagine perfection in uh, drag form. Now, we go over a number of different topics with Vanity, and we do touch upon David. David, who is the foundation of everything. And David slash Vanity has gone through some awakenings, some realizations that we go into in this conversation as well. I enjoy any time I get to spend with Vanity, and I surely enjoyed this conversation as well. And I hope you do too. Today on Tales of the LGBTQ+, join me as I have a conversation with the Vanity Fair. And that conversation starts right now. Hey, Vanity, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? Just another day in COVID lockdown here, you know? <laughs> the quotation marks for whatever this reality is. Ah, one day. Our current reality. You know, when I started this podcast, people were saying, are you going to do an audio podcast or a visual? And truthfully, I was going to do an audio. And I've been kicking myself at times because I've had to deal with COVID hair and COVID underneath the eyes and all those type of things. But finally, today, I understand exactly why we have the visual, because you are a beauty 
here on our screen. This is all smoke and mirrors, right? I can cover my COVID hair with a wig and <laughs> cover the dark circles with concealer and try and look flawless, I guess. I don't know if that's what I'm trying to do. So I think you probably just woke up this way. That's what I'm imagining. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> not at my age, honey, not at my age. <laughs> well, you know, how long does it take for you at this stage to get yourself into that visual aspect? You know what? I kind of miss the early days of drag in the early 2000s, late 90s, because we just wanted to look like real women. So we just put on a little bit of blush and mascara and penciled on some eyebrows when we were in drag. And then Drag Race came along and changed everything. And now we're like contouring and highlighting and putting glitter everywhere and making ours like it's a it's a whole different process now than it was 20 years ago. So it takes me like makeup alone takes a good two hours. And that's like half an hour before showering and shaving and then half an hour after that getting dressed as well and putting hair on. So, but makeup alone is like a two hour process these days. So, and I hate watching tutorials because I learn new tricks, but every new trick that I learn adds another five minutes to that process. So <laughs> it's a bit much. Makeup is also like my Zen time. Like I pour a drink, I put makeup or I put music on, I have a bath, I have a little ritual that I go through and it's kind of my, my me time and internal reflection kind of time. I just kind of get in the zone and tune out the world, turn my phone off. And so it is kind of, it's good time spent two hours. So. Absolutely. Well, it's a good time spent for us for sure. Uh, one of the things that, um, one of the things that people have been writing to me so far is, Douglas, this is great. You're sharing our community to everyone. Where are the drag queens? Where are they? <laughs> and yeah, where have they been? It's been kind of a conscious choice on my part because we have so many great uh, drag queens in our area, in Canada and around the world. And Vanity, you start off the series. <laughs> you know, if we have to go to the top best of the best, we're coming to you. I hope that's not just because I'm one of the last girls standing from the old start. <laughs> I went through the list, Vanity, and you were there, and you said, yeah, I've got some time. <laughs> hardly, hardly. <laughs> You're top of the top. I think I'm second on the pecking order now. It's like Twiggy, me, and then the other girls, right? So I'm like up there, up there with the, the old guard, so. Well, hey, old guard and new guard, because... Yes, you have been in the scene for many years, but you're also leading the vanguard of the Ladies of Tomorrow as well. So let's not forget that. I hope so. You've mentioned 20 years. When did Vanity debut on the stage? So I moved to Edmonton. The dates, like I said earlier, a disclosure, old lady disclosure, dates and and years don't stick in my head. So it was probably around 97 or 98 that I moved to Edmonton. And probably within a month or two of living here, these drag queens grabbed me on the dance floor at the old uh, Roost nightclub. And I don't know what they saw on the dance floor that inspired them. They're like, here's our phone number. We're going to put you in drag next weekend and take you out on the town. And I was pretty much hooked after the first time they painted me. So, of course... They did my makeup, so I definitely saw things in the mirror I could improve on and, and wanted to. So, but yeah, it's it's addictive. Like after the first time, you're hooked and you're in. And 20 years later, here we are, still still going strong. So, we we talk about the gay dar, and who knew until this time that there was actually a drag dar that you were giving off these drag vibes for people to come get you. Mind you, at that time, I was like a small town boy who had just moved to the city and I was in my first gay bar and I was letting loose and living life. So I'm quite sure I was giving off some kind of energy that, you know, most people probably don't give off. <laughs> did you perform your very first night in drag or did that come later? Yeah, the first night out was a very like night out on the town, drinking a little bit of dancing, having fun. Drag was the drag scene in Edmonton was so different back then. You you just didn't get invited to do shows because you were new and you there was a pecking order and you really had to prove yourself before you got invited to do an event so i had a lot of work to do before i finally got on stage but it didn't take too long i think within a year i was being invited to do events and stuff so so who was the the queen that invited you onto her show and uh, allowed you to perform for the first time uh oh dear my drag mother 
her and she's moved to Calgary since then, but her drag name is literally Mary, Mother of God. <laughs> she put me in drag for the first time. I can't remember if she had a show back then. If it wasn't her, it definitely, I think, was Amanda Love, who was um, the current reigning Miss Gay Edmonton at the time, I think got me out to my first, like, fundraiser drag show at The Roost, so. And which kind of led to my court involvement. Yeah, that kind of led to my charity court involvement and a whole 20 years of fundraising and stuff too, so. Do you, do you remember your first song that you performed? Oh, I don't, honestly. I, I was a country girl back then, so it probably was either Reba or Dolly Parton. I, one of the two, I'm assuming, but I kind of was a Celine fan too. It could have been Celine. I, I, it's so long ago, honestly, I don't remember. One of the things that I've always loved about your drag performances is that there's Vanity Fair, the queen, and we see your image, but you also have always shown great respect to the pop culture women uh, mainstream, the Rebas, the Celines, the Shares, and you've incorporated them into your show. Why has that been an important aspect of your performing career? I think... I think when I started doing drag, drag was still kind of a, like a subculture that wasn't so mainstream and out in the public, right? And I think back in the day, impersonating a diva was a way to legitimize drag and legitimize dressing as a woman back then. Maybe not so much in my time, but I know even just a few years before I started, like, you know, drag was still an iffy thing. And if you were caught out in public and drag, it was still an issue and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think. I could just kind of grew up in that culture of like, okay, find some girls that you can look like and impersonate and bring that to the stage. And then as my list of divas grew over the years, I guess I just kind of embraced that. And you know what? And with Drag Race and the way drag has changed recently, I really struggled for a couple of years. Um, I don't know if you remember that period of time, like Lilith came out and, and the House of Homicidal and drag kind of like freaky drag and alien drag and animal drag, all this stuff was cool. Like anything went. And I really struggled with whether my style of drag was relevant anymore, but I kind of decided that I just need to stick to what I do best because that's what got me where I am. That's what people love. That's what people have loved for, for 20 years. And I think I just decided I need to stick to my guns and like fill my niche in the drag scene. So I think when I go on stage now, even though I'm doing old school glamour kind of stuff, it, it stands out because there is so much variety in drag nowadays. So, but it was a struggle. Like for, I think I talked to Twiggy about this too. We really struggled with whether our old school glam traditional drag was even valid anymore. And we just had to push through that and keep bringing what we bring to the stage. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's so needed. And what I've always found with, Twiggy and yourself and others uh, with that more old school style is that even though there's the impersonation of others, there's that authenticity and it's that it's that little gay boy, bi boy who's in their bedroom singing along with the pop divas and it's that classic hairbrush up to the mouth singing, performing that we all relate to in our way so i see you're performing for us who've been through those moments before and so absolutely needed and desired for sure and even like living in vagerville as a teenager you know i definitely you know had those moments i was running through the house in my mom's heels when she wasn't home <laughs> i remember one day in particular I was ironing clothes and I had a RuPaul, one of RuPaul's old albums on. And my mom came in the room and she's like, oh, who's this singing? So I showed her the CD cover and she's like, oh, this woman is amazing. Like, she's gorgeous, right? And I was like, mother, that's a man. Like, she had no idea. <laughs> so there was a lot of learning. And then my mother also was shocked to learn that I loved ABBA just as much as she did back in the day, right? But, you know, it's kind of all those gay stereotypes that just kind of trickle into our lives and or we don't know are influencing us as we grow up. and then. So when my mom was listening to ABBA, I was dancing along. So you were soaking it all in <laughs> um, with your mom and family. Have they come to see you perform? Do they know the Vanity Fair side of David? For sure. I mean, with social media now, I'm definitely out there. It's public. Everyone knows. Uh, my parents have been to a few shows over the years. They've come to like some of the drag queen uh, Mother's Day brunch events and uh, 
a headliner show that I did years and years ago for Jeff and Daisy. My parents came to that as well. And I don't, the very first time I showed my mother pictures of me and drag, she like burst out laughing hysterically. And which was not the reaction I was looking for. <laughs> Her and my aunt were together and they were just cackling and laughing and thought it was hilarious. And I said, like, what the hell are you laughing at? And they're like, well, when you sit and you try and picture your son dressed as a woman, you have a certain mental picture in your head. And then when you see the reality, it's so much more than what they realized it was going to be. And we're just like blown away. And but my family has been accepting of every aspect of my life since I came out, really. So I I. I didn't have any negative responses coming out or growing up. So I really, I've been very blessed in that way. So. Oh, that's brilliant. Absolutely. A big shout out to the moms, the dads and the family who, um, who just follow with love. That's necessary at all times. I remember the first show they came to, my dad was like, well, like I can't go to the washroom alone. Like they came to evolution or it might've been play back in the day. I can't remember which, but when my dad came down the stairs, he's like, oh, it's just like a regular bar. And I was like, well, what were you expecting? Like a dungeon with like <laughs> chains and crosses and dark shady corners? Like it's a bar. We come here to drink. We come here to party. We come here to dance. It's like any other bar. But again, he had that preconceived notion in his head of what a gay bar was and was scared, but he sucked it up and came anyway and, and enjoyed the show. So I'm still to this day upset, though, that the gay bars are not like a Frankie Goes to Hollywood video. <laughs> I thought exactly that's what it was going to be, and that's what I wanted, and then it was so tame. Oh. At least some of them weren't. Oh, well. Oh, well. Hey, a question for you. There's some vanity-isms in your performances where one that comes up to mind is when you bend all the way back before you belt, belt out that big note. You don't... Is that something that you did on purpose or did you just reflect afterwards and going, oh, I'm always going backwards when it's about time to suck in wind or how did you develop that? Yeah, I think every drag queen has those like trademark moves. When I was back in my 20s, I used to be able to do like a full cartwheel in six inch platform stripper heels. Those days are long gone. I, I could still do it if I had to, but those days are gone. You know, now at my age, I'm like wear a corset, which restricts your mobility and all those things. But you know what? As a kid at family weddings and whatnot, I was always the best person at limbo contests. So I think that's where it comes from. Like, I don't people are I don't know. I can bend back pretty far without falling over. And I think people are amazed by that. But I don't know. It is kind of a trademark move now. And many try to imitate it and it just doesn't happen. So. <laughs> There's something got to ask you. And. And I kind of was joking in my head a little bit as you were going, ah, was it evolution or was it play? And I got to say, you know, for the drag queen that shut down bars for her year as being an empress, I can't, I can't understand how you could forget. <laughs> oh, I know. They're all, I shut down so many. They're, they're all just a blur in my head. So <laughs> there's been so many over the years, though. Before we get into your year as being the queen, the empress here within Edmonton, it, has there been a favorite stage or has there been a stage when you've been like, this is the vanity stage for me to perform on? Oh, you know, there, like we said, there's been so many bars over the years. They all had stages of kind of different different caliber. I think because I started on the Roost dance floor at the Roost nightclub, I think that'll always be my favorite, all-time favorite. Um, Junction had a great stage there towards the end. We did a lot of shows there. And I think now Evolution, after the new stage that Christy Healy bought, I'm, we used to practically perform on that little cardboard box that they had, they called a dance floor <laughs> when they first opened. But the new dance floor is amazing. And it just allows you so much more um, flexibility and you can kind of plan out numbers and plan strategic entrances and exits and so but I think as each bar opens and closes they just find a place in your heart right and they become your second home for a while evolution right now is that place for me so I miss the roost I still miss the roost to these days but it, it'll never come back so we just gotta and I think evolution is kind of getting that roost feel of you know a great mix of people from all different walks of life and just having a good time and we just need to get back onto the dance floor we need that time and space and and give us that space and we'll create the aura for it 
Yeah. So let's go on to the Imperial Sovereign Court of the Wild Rose, uh, an institution, uh, a group of people that so very close to your heart. Can you tell us more about this court and who they are and what they do for the community? Uh, so the Imperial Sovereign Court of the Wild Rose is a, a nonprofit organization. We're on year 45 of raising funds for local charities in Edmonton. I think we're the oldest nonprofit organization, LGBT nonprofit organization in Alberta right now. So 45 years. Uh, I kind of came on the scene around Rain 21 and we're on Rain 45 now. So I've been right from the get go, been involved. Um, uh, the court. I think is misunderstood. We're kind of like this group of little misfit people that maybe don't feel like we fit in in other areas of the community. So we've kind of created an environment where those people can come together and accomplish the goals they want to accomplish because honestly, they all come to the organization with passion and drive and they just want to do good and help others and feel a sense of community. So maybe they're not getting that out there in the broader community, but feel like they get it with the court. So I like, I, we raise thousands of dollars for charity and I feel sometimes like a lot of that gets overlooked. So I, we're kind of just always been this little organization in the corner that's doing these amazing things, but maybe don't always get the recognition we deserve. But I think that's changing too. The court has really evolved in the last couple of years. I think COVID especially has forced us to um, branch out in different ways and find new ways of fundraising. And we've actually raised a lot of money this year despite the pandemic. So I'm really impressed with the, the current reign and the current board of directors. And yeah, the court will always have a place in my heart. It, it means the world to me and and it makes me emotional. So. <laughs> yeah, and which is great. You know, there's, there's a couple of things I want to mention here. You said thousands of dollars. Well, it's more than just thousands of dollars. If we take a look at the lifespan, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars that have gone back into the community, that have gone towards HIV funding, which have gone towards scholarships for our youth. This uh, court and the court system as a greater large entity has been a lifesaver and is a much needed part of anyone's community. You talk about the misfits, uh, you know, that, that have gone into creating this, you know, you've gone, you've, you've been part of it year in and year out and you haven't broken allegiance and you haven't gone away for years. So what is it that's always brought you back? Whether you're a sucker for punishment or not, but what has brought you back? <laughs> That's a huge part of it. I'm horrible at saying no. So it is very easy to just get suckered into that. Like there's annual events that are on the calendar every year and you just go to them because you believe in what they're doing. Honestly, the court is all about the people, you know, it's people from all walks of life. It's people with different abilities. It's people from different cultures, different races, and they just bring heart and passion. That's like the base of what we do. They may not be the best people at makeup. They may not be the best performers, but they go out on stage and give it their all to raise money for causes that need it. And you, you think we're like this little misfit organization in Edmonton, but pretty much every city in North America has an organization like ours that is doing good like that as well. So across the United States, Mexico and Canada. So that's, that's a lot of good we're putting out in the world. So it just, it's one of those things that just has always filled my soul. And, you know, I come home from an event and know we've raised a certain amount of money for a certain cause and my heart just feels full and I can go to bed and sleep at night peacefully knowing that I've done some good. So absolutely. And then wake up in the morning with the, the perfect face and ready to go again. Well, maybe half depends which side I sleep on, but yeah. <laughs> the rest is on the pillowcase and you can just put it up there. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about your year, the year that you reigned. What was the number and who was involved in your court that year? Okay, so I was Empress 37 of Edmonton. So that's what, eight years ago already. It doesn't seem like that long, but uh, my emperor was uh, JJ Valour, uh, Yust Bob and Kitty were my Imperial Crown Prince and Princess. Tequila Mockingbird was involved and Genuine Valour, they were my Duke and Duchess. 
And we reigned during kind of a challenging year where the community was changing. Almost every bar in town had closed before I was crowned empress. And there was no plans to open another one until the following fall when I was stepping down as empress. So I think investiture for my reign was the very last event that they had at Junction. And then we had to find other venues and we had to find other ways of raising money. And every time we would find a new venue, I, this is how I got my reputation for closing bars because not only gay bars, but we moved to, oh, like Hooligans Pub and some other little community pub and they all closed too during the year. So I would book all these events at a venue and then they would close and then I would have to rebook and reschedule all these events all over again at a different venue and just keep going. Uh, somehow we raised $25,000 during that year. I don't know how we did it, honestly, because it was it was a train wreck. And then towards the end of the year, we got news that Evolution was going to open at the September, like literally a week after Coronation happened. <laughs> so, so the people who took over for me had a bar, they had a venue, they had it pretty easy. But you know what? I had I had people write me letters before I applied to be Empress saying, don't do it the court is not going to survive this year without venues and it's going to be on your shoulders. You're going to be the one they blame if the court folds because you let things crumble during this year. And it just honestly drove and inspired me even harder to, we're going to do this no matter what it takes. And, you know, you can't just let 38 years of history just crumble because there's no gay bars in town. You just have to find ways to raise money and keep going. And, I did get that reputation as the bar closing empress. And I think Rob was relieved that I stepped down before evolution opened. He's scared that I'm going to run again though. My decade's coming up. So I you might just see Empress 47. You never know. I still have, still have some energy left in me. So, but yeah, it was a challenging year, but you know what we like, we made it through and the court carried on and now we're at year 45, eight years later. So it's, yeah, it's amazing. And so much was learned that year, too, just on how drag could be brought out of the confines of a gay bar uh, where there's a stage and there's a ready-made setup for it where you've had to be able to branch out and find different avenues to do that. And I look at what's been happening in the past two years uh, with the court, especially with COVID taking place. And now you see a lot of the online shows and people like yourself doing videos for this. And yet here you would think it's going to be a huge de detriment, which it is, but yet all of this money is still being raised. And I, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow smoke up, up your butt here for a second. <laughs> but I think a lot of that's got to come back to your reign where – all of you faced it as a challenge and you persevered and you showed the way that, yes, it can be done. So I think a lot of the success that's happening now can be brought back to your reign and say, hey, this is where we learned this from. We did. Like, we really had to be creative. So, you know, I think that was kind of the start of, OK, like, why not have an event in a hotel? And then all of a sudden taking an event out of the bar makes it accessible to all ages. We can have minors and, you know, which probably led to, yeah, the beginning of the amateur pageant and the junior pageants and all these things that we do now that include people who are not old enough to get in the bar. And yeah, it's pretty amazing, actually. I, I never thought of that, but I guess, yeah, we were really the start of a lot of things that happen now. And even this last rain, like I know with COVID happening, a lot of courts were struggling with what to do. Do we crown new monarchs? Do we just kind of ride out the pandemic and see how it goes? And at the time I was the, the college president, College of Monarchs president, and we had candidates that were willing to take on the year no matter what it brought. And I, I just fought because I'm like, why wouldn't we give them that chance? Why would we put some old girls in place that are just gonna hold down the fort for a year when we have young people who want to do this and they're ambitious? And I think honestly, the court was at a crossroads where if we didn't start evolving and changing and getting with the times, we were gonna start becoming irrelevant. So I think the direction this reign has taken us branched out. I think we've connected with a lot more people outside the gay community as well. And I think that's going to be crucial to our survival going forward too. So. Yeah. And important what you said was candidates, plural, that there are more than one that were willing to take this up and say, yeah, we can do this. So definitely all of you that were part of your court of that year, you should, you know, 
pat yourself on the back because I think a lot of it has comes from it. Yeah, not all reigns are about how much money you've raised. You know, sometimes there's more that's accomplished community-wise, not so much the grand total at the end of the year. We didn't raise as much money as other reigns, but I, yeah, we held, you know, kept this court going strong and uh, managed to get through the year and keep us going. So, For many people who are listening to us today, this may be the first time that you've ever heard about this court or the court system. Uh, so Vanity... Your title for the year was? I was I was Her Most Imperial and Sovereign Majesty, Empress 37 of Edmonton and Northern Alberta. Calgary has their own court, of course, so they kind of rule over Southern Alberta and we get the North. <laughs> I ask this knowing what the answer is, but does this mean that when you have your reign that you are only staying in your area? Like, you know, you're queen of the North and if you go, no, if you go south, there's going to be war. Or do you bring your fabulousness everywhere? Choosing to run for such a title is a huge obligation and a huge undertaking. You're committing an entire year of your life to this organization and the community. So you agree in a contract, basically you sign saying you will travel travel to other cities, a certain number of cities over the course of your reign. So, you know, I traveled to Vancouver and Regina and Winnipeg and all these Calgary, all these other cities representing Edmonton in the hopes that when our coronation came around, people would, would travel and come have a good time here. So it is it is a huge network of people across Canada and North America. You know, I have friends in Toronto. I have friends in Vancouver. I can go anywhere in Canada and know there's people there that I'm going to know and have a connection with. So that's really unique, I think. You know, it, it's so much bigger than just our little small community. We are also responsible for all the fundraising efforts for an entire year in our own community, plus the travel requirements. So it is a big undertaking. It's expensive. And it definitely was something that had to fit in my life personally as well. Like it, it takes planning to have the right time in your life to do that because it's it's a huge, huge project for the year. So. so this title is not the only title that you've experienced in your life. You've won local shows that uh, where you've gained titles that way, but you've also been bestowed titles as well. There's like a laundry list of titles, but can you share with us some of the ones that, you know, jump up in your head at the moment? Oh my God. How long do you want this podcast to be? <laughs> <laughs> we can do hours. It is horrible because I, you know, I have held almost every title possible in the city. You know, probably the most memorable was probably my first reign as Miss Gay Edmonton. Um, that's a lot of years ago, 18, 19, or 20 years ago even. And even during that year, there were some major moments that stuck out. Uh, as Miss Gay Edmonton, I was invited to basically be the parade marshal for the very first Pride Parade that went down Jasper Avenue. And I remember thinking at the time, like, like who the hell am I? I'm like some country boy in a dress. Who am I to lead the parade down Jasper Avenue? But as Miss Gay Edmonton, that was definitely a huge memory that sticks out in my head. And Pride has come so far since then. I think that's too, how I kind of got my, my involvement with the Pride Society with Binky years ago. And we made a lot of change happen there. <sighs> oh, but everything like Miss Gay, I've been Miss Merry Christmas, I've been Queen of Hearts, I've been uh, all these things. And then I've been bestowed titles, as you mentioned, from the um, international court system. So, you know, I have a Lifetime Achievement Award and I have a Double Headed Eagle Gold Award from Nicole the Great, the Grand Poobah down in there in San Francisco. And uh, probably the most recent, the one that means a lot to me is, uh, you probably remember LJ Steele. Um, arranged before he passed for me to have an ultimate title. So ultimate titles are recognized within Alberta and they're, they're kind of like a lifetime achievement award of like, you're doing something no one else is doing. So we're going to honor you. So I am queen of hearts, Ultima of all Alberta as well. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of titles and they all blur together, but they all kind of have the same common goal of just. It's brilliant. It's ironic, too, because I know my drag name is Vanity Fair, and I think people think I'm like this stuck-up bitch who's full of herself, but deep down inside, I really am a, like a very humble person, and I don't always feel like I deserve all these accolades. I think everyone in the community who does work deserves the same recognition, and just, yeah, I don't know, it just rains titles in my life, I don't know. <laughs> 
But it comes across, though, just talking to you as Vanity or talking to you as David, that that humbleness, that little boy from Vagerville is always there. And, you know, and you've worked hard. You've worked your ass off. And so to get a little bit of a title, a little something, something, it's a good thing. And you 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 can embrace it. You're allowed to. Uh, Binky just passed on something to you as well, which was it Binky? Yeah. And that kind of happened. This is extremely important. So what did Binky just pass on to you? That kind of happened early in the pandemic too. Yeah. I kind of forgot about it, honestly, because I haven't been out performing in bars and using the title. So yeah, I was actually uh, just given the entertainer of the decade title from Binky. So that's a court title that gets passed down every 10 years from. So the previous queen who held the title gets to choose who who deserves it for the next 10 years. So I waited a long time for that title. <laughs> waited a long time, but you've worked your ass off to make sure that you you are still that viable queen that you've always been. And, you know, Binky and Twiggy are previous winners of this. And that's high, high quality. So congratulations for that. That's that's top notch. Let's go on a little bit from this. And I want to talk Vanity Fair, of course, but by talking to Vanity Fair, we also have to acknowledge David. And David is just as important, if not as important as the visage that we see here and that we're talking to. Uh, David, you recently announced on Facebook uh, something very personal about your life. And this has been just a very recent announcement. Um, can you please share with everyone your announcement? I think to start, it's important to recognize that while I was doing all these things in the community, I also was fighting my own battle with mental health and all these other issues under the makeup that probably people don't know about and don't, don't see because I don't let them see that. So I think years ago david and vanity were very different people and over the years vanity's confidence has definitely rubbed off on david and he's i they're more the same person now than they were and it really i just recently disclosed that i am going to choose to identify as non-binary um which at my age seemed a little ridiculous i'm not gonna lie i was like am i crazy like why am i doing this but you know what, like, you know, as well as I do, when we grew up, there was two gender options, male and female, nothing in between. And over the years, we've learned that everything is on a spectrum. There's, there's no word that defines any one person. So we have to find our own identity, right? And I just feel, I think over the years, David and Vanity have merged, and they're more of a fluid entity, you know, I said in another interview, like, there's days at work where I'm at work with my boy haircut and my jeans and t-shirt and vanity, like, comes out of me in some comment or, you know, like, she's just in there all the time and she comes out and, and vice versa. I think sometimes, you know, vanity has a few too many drinks and David's sensibility has to be like, okay, bitch, like, pull yourself together because you've got a, got a show to do here, right? So I, the, the two have just merged and other than my physical body, identifying as male i don't really relate to anything else hyper masculine if that makes sense and you know like i've been wearing makeup since i was 13 years old and i've been i love perfect eyebrows and i like big hair and i like my boy hair to be perfect and i like i'm just so much more complicated so much more uh yeah in in what's, what's the word complexity i guess than just the word male can define so i've just kind of, and it, it was a process for sure. I think I'm in a relationship now where I feel safe to express myself freely and know that I'm not getting judged or thought differently of. So it's nice to just kind of let go and actually be my genuine self because I know there's a lot of people in the world who think they know David as well, but David is also very good at just putting on a facade and a happy face and not letting people in and not letting people know what's going on in their head. So um, I think, I'm just in a, an age and a situation in my life right now where I just feel I can express myself freely and be my genuine true self without having to put on an act for anyone. And like at 45, I'm like, oh my God, it took a long time to learn that lesson. <laughs> I feel like I've been trying to learn that lesson for 25 years, but I think it's actually cemented in there now. And uh, yeah, it just felt like the right thing to do. So 
I'm very happy for you. Very happy for you. If people our age, or my age, and a little even, like, we need to kind of get with the times. And, you know, I know there's a lot of people our generation that are resistant to a lot of the millennial <laughs> crap, they call it, which it's not. But um, the world's changing. So you either keep up and stay relevant or you get left in the dust. So I've been just trying to evolve the last couple of years and learn and listen rather than voicing my opinion sometimes. And, you know. Yeah, see, when we were growing up, because I'm the same age as you, and it's, you know, this is my 46th year, and we didn't have all of this terminology when we were growing up. We It was this nothing. Um, and you said it perfectly with it had to be two genders and it had to be this. And we're learning this language now, and we have to be open and receptive for it. And we also have to be receptive in the future because a lot of the vocabulary of the future hasn't been created yet because we're still discovering and we're finding those nuances and this is an exciting time so we either embrace it or we become a stick in the mud and shut the world out and as you know all the vibrant colors that we let in is so much better uh what are the pronouns that um we should use for you now have those pronouns changed well that's the thing this never really felt like something I wanted to do to be treated differently or spoken to differently or seen differently. It, it was more of an inner peace kind of thing that I needed to do for myself. So I guess with drag, I've always used all the pronoun like freely, you know, if I'm with a group of drag queens and we're boys, we still call each other she and her and girl and, you know, and, and vice versa in drag. I am a little more picky when I'm in drag. I prefer feel female pronouns because I don't know something about someone calling you dude when you're in drag is just kind of not <laughs> doesn't feel right right but honestly I just it's not something I'm going to be hypersensitive about or correct people on I don't think anything's going to change in my life in that respect they them is kind of a new thing that I'm just kind of getting used to but yeah he she her whatever bitch whatever you want to call me I'll answer I don't know. <laughs> just make sure you call just make sure you call yeah, exactly. Just call. Yeah, exactly. So what was the moment like just before you pressed enter when you announced on Facebook your realized self? What was that moment like just before pre pressing send? Right. So it, it's kind of something I've been discussing with my partner for probably a couple months off and on. Not super seriously. It's just kind of always been in the back of my mind. Um, something about that day it just felt right for some reason I kind of reached out to someone my age who had done a similar thing months ago and and said like am I being foolish am I like are people gonna ridicule me like how is this gonna go over and and they were like absolutely not like it's never too late to start living your truth right so um it, it was terrifying but I'm also kind of a strong enough person now to not really care or give a shit what people think so I kind of I had a massage book that night, so I strategically posted it and I hit send and turned my phone off for a couple hours and then just went and did my thing and, and, and came home to nothing but like rave reviews and compliments and personal private messages and messages on Facebook. And so it felt really good. So yeah, it was a lot of love. Yeah. At this stage in the game in my life, I, I know who loves me and who supports me. And, you know, as long as the people who are closest to me and mean the most are okay, then I'm okay. So. so where does Vanity Fair go from here? You know, Vanity, you've been in the system of drag for a number of years. And, and you talked about um, what should you do once RuPaul had started and all these other aesthetics became popular. So you've become more comfortable with yourself and who you are and, and what you have to offer. Vanity 3.0? What will Vanity 3.0 look like as you move forward in your career? Oh dear, I don't. Oh, I don't honestly know. Honestly, the the pandemic has changed so much. Like Vanity was always full steam ahead, and never had a break because there was always events on the calendar weeks down the road. So my life was never, personal life was never allowed to be spontaneous or, you know, just drop things and go camping or, you know, so I think um, I needed a clean break and I took a very long break from drag during that first lockdown. 
And then recently I've kind of got more into the like online video kind of thing. I kind of like that I can control all the lighting and <laughs> different aspects of my number. And if I hate it, I can just re-record it and make it perfect because that's kind of something that drives me inside. But I think going forward and Vanity will still always be like a community queen and involved and out. But I think going forward, I'm going to have more of a healthy balance between having other hobbies other than drag and and doing I don't like I don't see myself committing to things months down the road like I used to I kind of am enjoying like living in the moment and you know like on a particular weekend if it's supposed to be warm and I want to go camping or go for a hike or go skating I know Rob's laughing right now because <laughs> I've kind of taken up all these things that people don't expect of me in the last couple months and uh I'm enjoying life. I honestly, with my current partner, I feel like I'm like truly like living life right now, not just going through the motions and doing what people expect of me. So I think there'll be a healthier balance. I'm never going away. I'm I'll be that queen who's 85 years old looking for that world record of, you know, <laughs> oldest queen in the world or whatever. I'll still be going strong. So I'll never give up drag. But yeah, there's definitely going to be a few changes in that respect. Your makeup today is flawless, and it and it's beat for life. Of course, you're looking great. Um, <laughs> Chick McNuggets is that your recommendation for how everyone should look so young and so fit? I, Chicken McNuggets, you would think would backfire on me. Like you think I'd be like 300 pounds and like. <laughs> <laughs> barely able to get off the couch to do drag but yeah yeah they're kind of a thing the thing people don't realize is like doing a drag event is like a whole day of preparation right like most days i'm at work for eight hours I barely get a lunch break so i don't really eat i come home i shower shave and i start getting a drag i don't sit down and eat dinner and i don't so by the time a drag event is over like i'm starving to death and i need food and also if you've had a few drinks McDonald's is a good thing that just kind of sits in your gut and you know is not going to go anywhere. So, but yeah, I love chicken nuggets. They're so good. <laughs> you know, and this this interview today is being done at the very end of April, and it's going to be released right away at the beginning of May. Really, I should sit on this a little bit and get this segment uh, sponsored by McDonald's. Ah, <laughs> uh, next time, next time when we do our drag panel, we're. Just to let everybody know, we're planning a drag panel where we can have the queens on to uh, swap some stories and maybe then we can get the Mickey D's delivered and we can eat as we're uh, kikiing it. Is that what the kids say that these days? I don't know. I don't know. Because we do the drag queen bingo at 9910. So the very first virtual drag queen bingo that we had to have, someone through Uber Eats had chicken nuggets sent to the bar for me. So I was eating them while I was calling bingo. It was great. Yeah, living my best life. <laughs> well, and even like that, you, that you mentioned drag queen bingo is something that has caught on greatly and has been um, an outlet for yourself as well. So let's have a uh, let's have a little bit of talk about that. So, what has drag queen bingo been like for you? And can you describe it to others who are hearing about it for the first time? So I was approached by um, a longtime friend, um, Ruby Slipper. Of course, she's kind of hung up her heels recently, but she's good friends with Kyla at The Common and 9910. So they approached me about hosting uh, a charity drag queen bingo, probably. Oh, my God. We're probably going on like four years already. And I was kind of at a point in my life where I was kind of the court stuff still meant something to me, but it was getting to be a little routine and a little predictable. Like I told you, you know, this, the same events are on the calendar the same weekend every year and you just kind of get in that flow of just going through the motions. So Drag Queen Bingo for me, when it caught on and really got popular and it kind of took off right from the get go, um, I just leave bingo every event <laughs> just feeling emotional and feeling like a million dollars like it just feeds my soul and part of it probably feeds my ego too i mean as the bingo caller i'm up there and i'm in control and i have the microphone and i can just talk for two hours and people either laugh or they don't i don't really care and people heckle me and i heckle them and so uh, as much as i hate to admit i do love being in the spotlight in that in that respect but i i just love like the last bingo i think we raised oh when was it I can't remember 
it might have been the very last live one. So before last year, before March, it must have been. Um, like we raised six thousand dollars in one night for the two project. It was right after two had lost their government funding for the youth shelter, and we had two seatings of bingo and raised six thousand dollars in one night. So to leave an event like that is just kind of mind blowing and overwhelming and makes you feel like a million dollars. And I know my part in that is small. You know, Kyla organizes the bingo and the event and the staff and Ruby does her part and, and I just show up and look gorgeous and host. That's literally all I do. But yeah, to just be a part of that. And it's it's been amazing. It's kind of revitalized my drive to, you know, like a, a new event that's fresh and new and successful and and does a lot of good. It just kind of renewed my passion and renewed my my spark for fundraising and, and for drag really too. There's all of these new events that we didn't have when we were growing up and these events that weren't available in our 20s and our 30s. But I would love for you to talk a little bit about queer prom here in the city and attending those events uh, where we have identified LGBTQ plus youths attending high school prom. What was it like the first time you were able to attend such a prom? Oh, that's a few years ago already. And honestly, it's been a couple of years since I attended prom, but oh, it's the most amazing experience too. It's crazy to me, like, like I didn't come out until after high school because I was so scared. And to go to an event where you see kids who are 10, 11, 12, 13 years old who already have figured out who they are, they figured out that they're going to live their life a certain way and 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 roll with it right just to see them enjoying life and making connections because i'm sure connecting at that age is sometimes a little different i mean we have the bars and clubs and and other social events but for kids that age i think it's really hard for them there might be one or two other kids in their school who who identify the same way but to see a whole room of hundreds of kids who are you know just queer and proud and rainbows and glitter and everything you can possibly imagine going on in the same it's amazing it's just yeah i'm so glad there was a year where prom almost didn't happen and the court kind of stepped in and and donated some money to make sure the event happened that year and then we actually donated some extra money to kind of create a reserve fund for them as well so if they were ever in a, a bind again the the event had to happen it has to happen so yeah and i re recall seeing pictures online where there was a lineup of people to get into the event because it was maximum inside and people from the court went outside and performed for the people waiting in line as well. Yeah, I was there that year too. Yeah, the prom the last couple of years sells out every year. Like they they can't get a space big enough to accommodate everyone. So yeah, yeah, we had a, a boom box. <laughs> and we were, I think we might even have been using someone's CD player in their car with their doors open and blasting the stereo. And yeah, we did drag numbers out in the parking lot at the Lions uh, Senior Center there and entertained the lineup. And I don't know if some of them ever got in to the dance. I don't think they probably did, but they had a good time out in the parking lot. We made sure of that before we left. Left, so who are the drag queens uh, or drag kings uh, who have inspired you on your Vanity Fair journey? Oh, dear. Over the years, there's a lot of them. Um, probably the first one that comes to mind is Chatty Cathy Jackson. She's Empress Two of the Imperial Sovereign Court of the Wild Rose and at her age is still, you know, attends coronation every year, makes sure she's there. She still does drag. Twiggy paints her face and she looks and to just the fact that she still shows up that many years later and still cares about what we're doing is a huge inspiration to me. Uh, like I said, I'll be 80 years old and still doing drag. Someone might be pushing me in a wheelchair, but I'm going to be there. And uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Twiggy is a huge inspiration to me. She was kind of that queen that I looked up to when I was kind of getting started as a baby queen. I just remember watching her perform and how gorgeous she was and just being in awe of, of everything she did and and aspiring to that so yeah there's been so many over the years honestly a lot of them don't do drag anymore which is kind of sad i wish they were still kind of bringing that art to the to the community i think the kids need to see some you know the way the old girls did it back in the day too was totally different than now you know um there's so many and especially with the court every year there's a fresh batch of, you know, men, women, emperors, empresses who just 
you can't help but be inspired for. I, like Rob is also on that list. I know I don't know if he identifies as a drag king per se, but as an emperor, you know he he's had his moment in the in the spotlight performing and whatnot. Everything he does through evolution and actually every club he's worked at, he's been very heavy on like community involvement and. Uh, I, even with what's going on now, I know he's fighting for evolution so that they can reopen and, you know, keeps promising that it's going to be there when this is all over. And he just, yeah, eternal hope and and drive. He just does what he does and <laughs> endlessly, you know, like he just goes nonstop and I don't think gets the recognition he deserves either sometimes. So Rob, we're talking about Rob Borowski here in Edmonton, and uh, I can make the announcement that uh, we've been holding Rob's interview back for a little bit uh, because June is Pride Month, and I've wanted to put Rob front and center when it comes to Pride, Pride in Edmonton. So Rob's interview is going to be debuting uh, the first week of June, and it's going to be a long one because, as Rob says, his resume is more of a gay uh, gay resume because he's been involved in everything gay, and if it if it hasn't been gay, he'll create something that's gay. So that could be a two part or a three part just because of Rob because he sweats. It's gay. <laughs> it's just it. <laughs> and Rob, you know, Rob's been around as long as I have. He's been working in in buddies and clubs as long as I've been around too. So he's got just as long a history as I have in the community. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll look forward to that interview for sure. We've touched a little bit upon RuPaul and the drag race. What are your thoughts about this phenomenon that has taken place over the last 10 years with RuPaul? And how has it affected the uh, community, both in a positive or even a negative way? It's definitely changed drag, I think. I think overall for the better. I think like drag is mainstream and it's celebrated now and and not even just drag like the current uh, season of drag race just had their first uh, male trans drag queen and and that was a huge step forward as well so I think there's been little steps along the way even within that big conglomerate that have little celebrations along the way I think um Drag is more of a, drag literally stands for dressed as girl and drag is so much more than that now. I think people just, drag is a way to express yourself freely, whatever that looks like. Like I said, you wanna look like an alien, you wanna look like a stalk of broccoli, like whatever, it all, you know, if you can go on stage and find a song that fits and make it work, it's entertaining and people eat it up, right? So uh, yeah, drag has just blossomed and it's so much more diverse, I think, than it was and so which makes shows more diverse and more interesting and more entertaining and more uh, appealing to a wider variety of people straight people included i think you know drag race has also given the straight community a little peek into into gay life that they maybe were curious about or never even knew existed or you know so i think it's definitely definitely helped in the majority of ways i would say um Negative. I sometimes feel like the world is a little oversaturated with drag sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, in the beginning of Drag Race, you know, RuPaul wasn't always so open to trans performers or or drag queens who identified as female. And, you know, there was a lot of discussion. It sparked a lot of discussion, which I guess is a positive. But, you know, there were some steps that had to be taken to, to get where we are now. Overall, though, I I think it's helped, you know local queens can go to a bar with a show proposal and an idea and and an amount of money in their head they want to be paid <laughs> for their art form which i think has changed a lot too drag was always a very charity driven free kind of art form and i think now i don't think we'll ever get to the point where you can make a living doing drag in edmonton but you know even just the fact that you can be compensated for your drinks and your cab ride to the bar and, and it makes a huge difference because most of drag is out of pocket, right? Like I know we look like a million dollars, but like it's <laughs> our savings accounts take a beating too. So uh, I think sometimes too drag race has kind of elevated drag to maybe a level that's not achievable or attainable for everyone. I know these Queens go on drag race and they look amazing, but they've spent a lot of money a lot of their own money to get on the show even to apply you need to spend money on your application and outfits to even get on the show 
And then not to mention like you're giving up how many months of your life taking off work. So you're secluded for filming and uh, like, I'm sure the majority of Queens come out of their drag race experience in the hole, like in debt. And that's sad to me in a lot of ways. Cause it's just, I don't think it, it people are always on my case too, to go on drag race Canada. I'm like, well, if you want to sponsor me, I'll consider it, but <laughs> you know, I'm not going to give up three years of my life and three years of work or three months, sorry, three months of my life and three months of being away while my clients at work are finding a, a new hairdresser and you know it's a huge sacrifice and so i don't really think it's realistic for everyone which is sad you know it should be something i think that's attainable for everyone and it's kind of an elitist thing now yeah there's a recent article that came out that talked about the cost of drag and up until about season eight and season nine of the American RuPaul version, it was more affordable. You could wear your homemade outfits more often. But now, especially this past year, the wardrobes over $20,000, $30,000. And some aren't even saying how much they're spending anymore because the cost is so big. And it's so noticeable when you compare it to the person who's not able to afford. And now we have, oh, you know, H&M. I don't want to see H&M. Well, I, you, know, <laughs> you know, as it turns out, um, the, the queen who got berated for it, she had to sell all of her outfits during the pandemic because she had lost her income in performing. So during that time away, she sold all of her outfits in order to survive and then was brought back to the show and had no dresses. So she had to go out and find something. So it just goes. Oh, I hadn't heard that yeah, story. I'll send you oh, that article. Oh, that's sad. See? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stuff like that breaks my heart. I just... So it's that's a negative part for it as well. And I need to harp on it again, just because I love the queens who do the icons, who do the classic drag. For anybody entering this uh, realm, do make sure that you go towards the women who have been performing for a while and learn from them and learn the history of it. Because it's more so than lip syncing for your life. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yes. If you, if you could lip sync for your life for to a certain song, is there a certain song that you'd be like, yeah, I'm the winner. I'm the lip sync assassin for I have a few that just kind of like come out of my soul pretty easily. Uh, I think this is like an old school song, but if I had to do New York, New York by Liza, I think I could kill that. More recently, one of my boyfriend's favorite numbers that I perform is I Drove All Night by Celine Dion. Um, when I told him the original song was by Cyndi Lauper, like <laughs> 25 years ago, he's like, really? I would never would again. <laughs> but uh yeah, it's a song that kind of just comes out of me naturally without much effort. A lot of share stuff, too, I think I could really knock out of the park if I had the opportunity. So I think that's a scary thing about going on Drag Race, too, is I watch these girls lip sync, and I don't necessarily know if I could slay every lip sync the way they do because of my style of drag. So it would definitely would be... And I also... Rue always talks about your inner saboteur, and I definitely have one of those inside of me, so... I don't know. It would be interesting. I think I would learn a lot, but I don't know if I'm up for it at my age. <laughs> Not going to lie. <laughs> Tell you the truth, though, and kind of bringing this conversation full circle. I think with your announcement last week and being your authentic self, I think your inner saboteur, I think it's going to go away because you're, you're being yourself now. And your authentic self is, has always shined. But I think you're going to recognize it even more. And that's amazing and remarkable. I don't know if the saboteur will ever go away. I'm, I'm just better at keeping her in her place and putting a gag in her mouth when I need to, to get on with what I need to do. So that's a hard lesson to learn. It's definitely been a process. So, yeah. Yeah. Ball gags can be good too. So embrace that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My mom is now gagging you know, for that part of this conversation. <laughs> um, hey, a question uh, to you. What would you say to that younger kid in Vagerville? What would you say to him, them, um, now if you had a chance to? I think if I had a chance to talk to David years ago, I would tell him that he doesn't need to take on the weight of the world. He doesn't need to 
take on other people's problems. He doesn't need to fix everything for everyone. He can focus more on himself and take care of himself rather than worrying about everyone else around him. And that's something I've done since I was three years old. So I know definitely that's a talk that probably should have happened years ago. But yeah, I, I take on a lot and I worry about people I care about and do my best to try and make their life easier or, you know, even if it's to my own detriment. So, yeah, I wish I had learned those lessons a little earlier, but. Hey, you're learning it now. Yeah, finally. Yeah. Hey, you know, for our community, we're not recognized in the school system and we didn't grow up learning about our history and learning about ourselves. And and there's that quote that goes around and I can't remember who it's attributed to it, but we live our lives giving off this performance and then our adulthood is picking apart which parts of that was true and which ones aren't. And and we and we're always coming out and we're discovering ourselves as we come along. And so no matter what age we are, we're always going to discover and we're going to learn and you're going to be loved. And whether I'm talking to Vanity or David, I know that you're completely loved. I've always hated that tagline, it gets better. I not hated it. It's just never sat well with me because I think it does get easier as we get older. But it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of conscious effort and a lot of self growth and, you know, evaluation to to get to a point where things are better. It doesn't just magically happen. You know, it takes a lot of conscious effort. So I, I find it deceiving sometimes to just say to kids or younger people, oh, it's going to get easier. You're going to graduate and the world is going to be a different place all of a sudden. It's not. It, you need to learn how to cope and you need to learn how to survive. and it's all a learning process and it does get easier. I, I finally at 45 feel like life is a little easier, but it's been a lot of hard work. Like it's been 20 years of, of struggle to get where I am. So. And we make, and we make mistakes along the way and it's okay. It's okay to make those mistakes. Um, in this interview, as well as in a previous interview, the word misfits came up and I, I giggle and laugh because I have a friends group uh, and our Facebook group is the misfits because we always identified ourselves and we're always, and we're just strange and weird. And, but we've embraced that ourselves. And I was thinking about that, you know, that during this pandemic, I have my blood family, a very small blood family who I'm close to, but then I have this larger chosen family that I'm dead without but it took so long to find this chosen family and it's taken so long to find this misfits group. And it's a lot of hard work. It takes time to create it and it a lot of trials and tribulations, but you do find it. It's just not handed over easily. Like I mentioned when talking about the court, how it's a group of misfits. I think because of my involvement and I am so out there, I think a lot of people would be shocked to hear that I a lot of times feel like I don't fit in in the gay community. Um, I've always been treated differently because I do drag and not in a positive way. Um, you know, I'm not the most masculine guy and I do drag and, you know, I'm skinny. I'm not muscular. I'm not a jock. I'm not a bear. I'm not any of these things. I kind of fall between the cracks in all these different boxes that gay men put themselves in. So in a lot of ways, the court was a natural fit for me because I don't feel like I fit in in a lot of other aspects of the community. And that probably sounds bizarre to people because they look at me as, you know, this huge entity in the community. But yeah, I've, I've literally been told by men that you are absolutely perfect in every way, but you do drag, so I can't date you. Like, that's sad to me. I finally found someone who celebrates the feminine side of my personality and, and that's amazing. But I know, like, it's not easy out there for queens on the dating scene. No, not easy at all. Well, that we need a panel for as well. We'll do a yes. We'll do a panel. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. Well, and the person's the interview that's going to be released just before yours is with Trevor Schmidt uh, from the acting world. Yeah, and you say I love Trevor Schmidt, and I love Trevor Schmidt. The interview talks about how he feels like he's an outsider to many especially the lgbtq world and yet he's got titles after titles and accomplishments and it's amazing how people feel 
the way that they do, and it's legit. Well, I can tell you right now, Vanity, as we come to the end of our conversation with each other, that when it comes to drag performers, there's drag performers, there's Vanity Fair. Well above. And for the people listening to us audio uh, style, I'm think of this as I'm squishing a face like kids in the hall. But, you know, <laughs> with Vanity being at the top of the head and people down below, <laughs> you are the epitome of what a drag queen is in performance and style and in grace. And uh, I just want to thank you for shining a light and helping so many people uh, within Edmonton, Northern Alberta, and wherever your light has uh, shone, because you have made a difference for our community. And so thank you. Thank you so much. That means a lot. I don't hear stuff like that a lot. So that means a lot to me. I... <laughs> Thank you. You did it right. You did it right. <laughs> so we're going to have you back in the future because we're going we we have a panel planned for with drag queens and much lighter and just sharing the stories and the backstage gossip and the people that we love to hate and all that good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> for another time, of course. Another time, yes. So until next time, on behalf of Vanity Fair slash David. Um, I want to thank all of you for listening to our podcast today. Always remember to be good as much as you can. And always remember to text when you get home. Until next time.